today we are starting a new sermon series called The Gift of Worship. It is gift season, it is, it is Christmas time, and we're going to talk about worship the next three Sundays. And what uh, you heard, uh, uh, Jenny Murray, our worship pastor, we call her Tweet around here. She's a songbird, a little Tweet. Uh, what you heard her say was, is that I'm going to teach for just a little bit about worship, then we're going to practice what we just heard. How's that sound? We're going to go back into worship and have a couple songs at the end of the service. So let me have about 30 minutes and just walk us through a little bit about what it looks like, the gift of worship. And there's three subjects we're going to cover in the next three weeks. The first is today, the gift he gives us in worship. Next week will be the gift we give him in worship. And then the third week will be the gift we give each other in worship. So it's going to be exciting. It's going to be fun. It's a new angle. I think you're going to like it. Our, our anchor scripture is Psalm 100. And, um, and I want you to just notice the happiness and the joy and the excitement in this psalm right here. It says, make a joyful noise to the Lord. Some of us, that's all we got. We, we, in first service, we went back into worship after I preached and tweet said, make sure you turn your microphone off in Jesus' name. <laughs> she actually said, in Jesus' name. Like she was rebuking me or something. Turn your microphone off. Because all I got is a joyful noise, you know. I'm not one of the singers in place, but I'm going to use what I got. By, by the way, before I read this passage, worship is more than 30 minutes on a Sunday morning. Uh, worship is the way we live our life. Worship is a, a life of obedience, a life of surrender, a life of joy, a life of transformation in Christ Jesus. But, but for this next three weeks, I'm specifically talking about corporate worship together on Sunday morning. When we come together, what happens in the space where we come together to sing and come together to rejoice before the Lord? So it says, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his, and we are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. That's a lot of goodness right there in one psalm, isn't it? Now, our blurb for this passage, for this uh, sermon series, is this. We gather in worship to have an experience. We're not coming to fill our minds. We're not coming to hang out. We're, not, we're coming to experience the greatest person you could ever experience in our lives. I don't want you to know more about him. I want you to know him in a deeper way. And when we come into worship, we can experience, now watch this, on three levels. First of all, it's personally. You know, I can be re listening to a song that somebody else wrote, and sometimes that song just doesn't convey my heart. It's okay. It's their song. I'll sing along. Sometimes there's a song we sing, and I'm like, how did they write this? This is exactly how I feel. And then there's sometimes I come in here, and I'm like, I don't care if anybody else on my row experiences God today. I'm going to experience God today. Because he is the God of the audience of one. When God went up on the mountaintop, when God said, Moses, I want you to bring all the people up the mountaintop, it started thundering and lightning and smoking, and the mountain was shaking, and the people said, we will not go up except for Moses. Moses was the only one. And he went up, and God didn't turn down the fireworks just because one person showed up. God will give you the full dose if you're the only one that dares to go into his presence. He, he, is, he will show up with everything he has, for one person that brings all that they have. So personally, you can experience God even if the people around you are not. Second of all, we experience God eternally. Do you know if you look at Isaiah or Daniel or Ezekiel or John the Beloved, whenever they, they talk about that other realm, whenever they talk about heaven, they talk about these angels that are flying around and angels that have wings and created beings that's got eyes and wings and wheels and stuff. And, and I always like the way they talk because they always use these words. And it was like in the form of sort of like. It's like, it's not like around here. I don't know how to explain in human language what I saw, but it was in the form of sort of like this, but it wasn't that. And so what happens is we, when we peer into the heavens, we see angels flying around. We see created beings that would freak you out if you saw them in your neighborhood. <laughs> Things are flying like crowns. Wow. You know, watch out, there's crowns flying. There's the cloud of witnesses, the saints that have gone before us. And when we come in here on Sunday morning, and the worship team, they're just, they're just 
kindling. They're just fire starters. They, their job is to start the fire and get out of the way. And then we join in, and suddenly the membrane between heaven and earth gets very thin. And suddenly we leave this temporal realm and we enter into the eternal realm of God where our past is gone, our future is secure, and we sing from this moment. And every song we sing has the ability to go back and heal, go forward and praise and make a way. We enter into eternity when we worship on a Sunday morning together. We're not having a temporal experience. One day we'll die and enter into eternity. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, your eternity has already begun while you have skin on it. And we're just simply tapping into eternity when we come into worship. And then the third thing is we get to worship corporately. You can worship God from home. You can. But, it's, but what you get to plus one is just you. When you come in here and we worship together, there's synergy. There is that peace that is bigger than the sum of its parts. There's, a, there's something we create with God loves unity. He loves relationships. So when we offer our gifts together, one plus one equals five. And that's why we worship together. We do it personally. We do it eternally. We do it corporately. Now let me preach at you for a minute. The gift he gives us. There are times almost in every service in worship I look around for someone who is sitting down. Many times they have their, hand, their head in their hands. Many times they're praying. I look for those who are depressed, discouraged, tired, lonely, and it's okay. This is the best place you can be. Your act of worship was getting in the car and showing up. That's it, period. And I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you that to have true worship, it all starts with him. And the worship he, we're going to talk about the gift he gives us. And sometimes we don't have anything to bring. We don't have joy in our heart. We're tired. We're depressed. We're dealing with something in real life. And we walk in here and we just want to sit where the people of God have created an atmosphere where somehow we can tap into God and find hope and find faith and find joy again. And that's okay if that's where you're at today. It's good enough. The fact that you came, he will honor that. Okay, so the gift he gives us. So today what we're going to talk about is his love for us. And I don't know if you noticed, but the songs we sung were about him to us. They weren't songs from us to him. They were songs from him to us. In fact, when we go back into worship, we're going to do that some more so that you're aware of we sing songs of his love over you. Now, that's not the only songs we sing because we're not the center of attention. He is. But it all starts with him. So here we go. I'm going to read Isaiah chapter 6, 1 through 8. And it says this, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Now, let me tell you, especially if you're an Old Testament saint, you would know the exact time you saw the Lord. If you saw the Lord, you would know everything, what you were wearing, what you know, what you, you know, like Tina will tell me sometimes, she'll say, I remember what I was wearing on that day. And I, I don't remember yesterday, you know, but she remembers what I was wearing 20 years ago when we went on that date. You know, I was wearing that sweater and those boots because which is cheating because she's always wearing sweater and boots. So, and second of all, I can't remember, so how would I argue with her, right? Like, I don't remember. So, but, but he, remembers the day, he remembers the day he saw the Lord. Now, it says, I saw the Lord, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, if you're one of those people that watch the news for four hours a day, you will see evil everywhere in the world. You'll see brokenness everywhere in the world. But, I, but here, Isaiah has seen the Lord, and when he sees the Lord, he says, Oh my gosh, the glory of the Lord is everywhere in creation. It's overwhelmingly good. It overwhelms the evil that we could see. The glory is everywhere. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. God likes pyrotechnics. <laughs> he don't need the special effects, but he can't show up without them. It's just who he is. 
And I said, woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Do you know what that must have been like for Isaiah? But pre-Christ dying on the cross, your sins have been atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, pick me, pick me. And I know, I know watch this experience. He sees the God of glory and he sees created beings and angels and he sees a cloud of witnesses. But in that moment, he cries out, oh, I'm a lost, I'm a sinner. Woe is me. And God makes it personal just to Isaiah. And the angel comes and touches his lips and atones for him. And as soon as he atones for his sins, he's like, now who are we going to send to do this? And Isaiah can't help but respond and say, pick me. I mean, after all you've done for me, I would like to do something for you. And that's what worship is. It's being overwhelmed with the wonder of God. You can't worship without wonder. It's it's being overwhelmed by the wonder of God and wanting to respond to him in an appropriate way and give a gift back. Three points. Number one, he gives the gift of his presence. He gives the gift of his presence. One time I was with some Methodist pastors. Actually, I hang out with Methodist pastors more than one time. But but one time I was with them, and one of the pastors talked about, yes, one of the things we care a lot about is the ministry of presence. I said, ministry of presence? I said, what's that? And they said, that's where you intentionally insert yourself in hard circumstances and just sit with the people that are going through it. You don't have to have the answers. You don't have to give them advice. It is just saying you will, you may have to walk through something hard, but you won't do it alone. And I said, well, most of us, you know, fear those circumstances. Most of us avoid sitting and going and being in hard circumstances. I said, I know that's the offering. That's the gift. That's the ministry is I choose to be present with you while you walk through this, even if it makes me feel awkward. And I, and I, I thought about that, and, and I want you to know that God cares more about your presence than he does your productivity. See, I, I didn't have time for prayer most of my life because I was busy and being productive for God. I, I, I didn't value prayer because I didn't see the value of prayer, I, but I did see the value of me moving things. And it came to a point where the Lord says, no, 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 I care about your presence with me more than I care about your productivity of what you can give me. I'd rather you just be with me. I value your presence. That's scandalous to me. Recently, I read a book called uh, The Gift of Being Yourself by David Benner. And he says this, what God wants is simply our presence, even if it feels like a waste of potentially productive time. That's what friends do together. They waste time with each other. <laughs> Isn't that good? He says, that's what friends do. They waste time together. They don't, if, your friend, if your friend comes over, you don't have to be productive. You just like being with them. Well, guess what? God just likes being with you. He, he, he don't need you to be productive for him. He just wants to be with you. And, and an hour with God is never wasted. It's never unproductive. You get to experience his goodness. So, Let me walk you through, so what is worship? What is worship? You know, in our lifestyle, it's obedience, it's surrender, it's it's transformation. But when we come in here corporately to worship, um, the first thing is, you know that God is omnipresent, right? God is everywhere all the time. You know that, right? He's there in your car when you listen to Christian music. He's there in your car when you're cussing at the driver that you don't like next to you. He's in your car. On your best days, he's in your car when you have a fit of carnality. I'm sorry, he's in your life when you have a fit of carnality. God is present when you sin. God is present when you do good. God is present all the time. So what is worship? Worship is the awareness of God's presence. Worship is you're driving down the road, you're not thinking about God, you're doing the daily stuff, and suddenly something happens and you become aware that he's there with you. And then you respond to that. So the first part is just being aware. The second is what God does, God wants to be known. God is big into self-revealing. You cannot have intimacy with someone unless you reveal who you are to that someone. 
God craves relationship. He loves relationship. To have relationship, you have to share your heart with people. You have to reveal who you are. So when God made creation and he made us, he didn't make us to look different than him. He made us to look like him because he wanted creation to know something about him. He loves to reveal himself. If you spend some time with the Lord, just you and him for a few minutes, guess what he'll do? He'll share secrets with you. He starts telling you things about himself. He, he, he craves relationship and intimacy, so he shares himself. Now, I'm going to share an intimate moment, and I'm going to beg forgiveness from some of my friends in the room. Yesterday, I was at the fig tree, and Debbie and Amanda were leading worship in the most amazing worship set I've ever been a part of. I walk in at the fig tree. This is a place to worship and pray, and Amanda and Debbie are the only two on the platform. I walk in. And I, you ever walk in and you just realize something heavy is going on right here? Sit your hiney down, right? So I, I went over and sat down, and, and here's what was happening. They were not singing songs that had been written before. They were singing new songs that they were making up on the spot, okay? But they were making up songs and singing off of each other back and forth. I've never seen a duet of new prophetic songs. So Amanda would sing something like, you are the righteousness you are the righteous standard for the earth. And Debbie would sing, from your righteousness we get our truth. We live in spirit and truth because of your righteousness. And then Amanda would say, and your beauty is radiating throughout the earth. And she would say, your beauty shows us your glory. They were going back and forth singing songs together about God. And it was one of the most beautiful. Now, then they got the throne room which is my, that's part of my second point. They get to the throne room and start calling, we enter into your throne room, and they start saying words like that. Now, these are females, right? These are females. Dudes might not quite say it the same way. You understand there's a difference between male and female. We, I can't tell you all that today, but I'll tell you another time, all right? <laughs> and they're like, they're like, we enter in your throne room. Oh, we just want to see your face. We want to hear your words. We want to know your heart. We want to move you with pleasure and joy. And it was all this intimate, feely, touchy. We want to know you. We want to know you. We want to know you. Tell us more. Tell us more. Tell us more. And that's what happened. So, so I said the first part of worship is awareness. We're aware that his presence is in this room right now. He, he's, he does not live in the galaxy far, far away. He does not. He's here right now. So the first part of worship is where? The second part of worship is he reveals himself to us, and worship is our response to that revelation. So he shows himself as, as king, and suddenly we, we respond to his kingship. Or he shows himself as loving father, and we respond as children to our father. It's that revelation and response, revelation and response. So, so there's this thing called the circle of love, and, and God tells us we should love God, Love ourselves, love our neighbor. Love God, love ourselves, love our neighbor. But where do we start? Where do we start? Do we start by loving God? Do we start by loving ourselves? Do we lo start by loving our neighbors? Well, the key to the circle of love is, is it doesn't start with us at all. It starts outside our circle. We love him because he first loved us. So he introduces his love to us so that we can love him back. He gives us his love for us so we can love ourselves. He gives us our, his love for others so we can love others. It starts with him. So would it shock you if I was to tell you, worship doesn't begin with you. Because God says, you will worship me in spirit and in truth. So Papa says, I'm not even going to trust these guys to worship me. So I will cause worship to start with me by putting Holy Spirit inside of them so that they can worship from spirit, worship from truth, and worship me appropriately. Worship begins with God <laughs> wooing us into relationship by showing us his wonder, beauty, power. And in that moment, we see he's altogether different. Oh, he's altogether different. And us finding a song or clapping of hands, prostrate, kneeling, doing something to respond back to that. Do you understand? We as New Testament believers are so, we take for granted the access we have to his presence. The Old Testament folks would have killed for what we had this morning. 
to just know as broken people we can come in in different levels of victory and failure, yet come at the feet of the cross and receive his presence as a gift to us this morning? Wow. And we don't take advantage of it. We go whole days without being aware of his presence. One of the most beautiful parts of worship, the gift that he gives us, is himself. He shows up and says, I want you to know me. I want to love you. I want to have a relationship with you. Wow. We need a radical revival of relationship with God. Amen. So let me just read this one little quote. Archbishop of Canterbury in 1492. That's a long time ago. It says, to worship is to quicken the conscience by the holiness of God, to feed the mind with the truth of God. To purge the imagination by the beauty of God. To open the heart to the love of God. To devote the will to the purpose of God. Living worship increasingly transforms us into the image of Christ. Worship, and I'll talk about this next week, is where we trade with God. We trade our will for his will. We trade our vain imaginations for his beauty. We change our consciousness for his truth. It's it's where we trade and exchange those things. The first gift he gives us in worship is his presence. Number two, the second gift he gives us is his perspective. You know, it says that every kingdom has a king and every king has a throne. Every kingdom has a king and every king has a throne. Whether you're reading Jeremiah or Isaiah or, or John, as they talk about what they see in that other realm, at the center of it all is always A throne with one who is sitting on it. There is a throne and one, not many. There is one, one way, one who sits on that throne. Now then the writer begins to describe other things that are happening in relationship to that throne. And what's key for our lives is we've got to get the throne in the center of our gaze and then learn how to see peripheral circumstances around the throne but keep the throne as due north. Worship is where we recalibrate our gaze back to the throne so we can gain perspective of the other things that's happened in our lives. What the devil wants to do is say, yes, there is something happening over here in quadrant seven. Give it your full attention. What Jesus always did is says, no, my gaze is on the throne. I know something's happening in quadrant seven. It has value. It has importance, but it doesn't get my gaze. Did you hear what I just said? It's on the radar. I, I, that information is important. But I'm not taking my gaze off the throne. Because if I take my gaze off the throne, I will misvalue the power of that circumstance because I've lost relationship with the throne. So we stay on the throne and then we feel everything else but the throne is our due north. Now we read something a minute ago in that passage that Isaiah says, I saw the Lord and he was high and lifted up. And the train of his robe fills the temple. Now, in the Old Testament days, if you were a king, you would wear a robe. The longer your robe, the more powerful you were and the more glorious you were, the more noteworthy you were. So this is what kings would do. A king would attack another kingdom, and if that king won, he would cut off some of the fabric of the robe of the opposing king and sew it onto the train of his robe. So every time the king conquered another king, he would cut off some of that fabric. He would sew it on to his robe. So the longer your robe, the more kings you've defeated, the more kingdoms you've defeated, the more glorious, more noteworthy you are. So the longer the robe, the better the robe. And Isaiah says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. So one day the Lord asked me, he says, are you a son of the throne room? I said, you know I am. In the last several years, I've learned how to go into the throne room. I love worship and prayer. I love entering before his throne. Most people who do not go there are afraid of his throne, and they're afraid of his judgment. I am not. If you spent any time there, 
You should reverence the Lord, but not fear the Lord. The safest place in this world is in the throne room. It's in the heart of God. More good happens in the heart of God. Adam and Eve ran away in their sin. We should run to the throne room when we're in sin. Run to Papa's arms when we're in trouble. So one day I said, are you a son of the throne room? I said, you know I am. He says, then where do you stand? I said, I the middle? I don't know. I mean, up front, I'm not a balcony person. I'm not a back row. I'm up, I'm up front. That's what I like to do. He said, no, but what are you saying on? I said, I guess to see a glass. I mean, I'm trying to scripturally work through this in my head. The Lord ever asked you a question, and you're, you're in your head going through the Bible trying to figure out the right answer? And by the way, God never asked you a question for his information. It's, oh, if God ever asked you a question, it's for your information. It's for you to know something, right? And he took me to Isaiah chapter 6. And he says, if you're a son of the throne room, you can't worship me from the throne room without standing on the train of my robe. So you worship me from every victory I've ever had and everything I've ever conquered. Every enemy I've ever defeated, death Hell, sin, sickness has already been sewed on to the train of my robe. My robe fills the temple. If you're a person of the temple, you stand upon my authority, my victory, and you worship me from there. People are like, I don't know why you're worshiping like that. You know, your life ain't all that awesome. Well, you don't know where I stand. I stand on the victory and the promise of what Jesus Christ has already done for me, and I can find my voice from there. So I'm going to ask uh, Jenny Murray, Tweet, to come up here and share a revelation that she has on this point and uh, share with us just a little bit. And this is powerful. Woohoo! I thought y'all were going to worship Riot when I was like, okay, we're going to shake hands now. I'm sorry. <laughs> Wait for it. Okay. So this is a testimony that I want to share. Um, Eleven years ago, I was in the toughest season of my life. And in my growth group, we call it, we were, I was at the wall. So the wall, you can't get over it, can't go under it, can't go around it. You're stuck. So I was stuck at the wall, and I didn't, I wasn't super spiritual back then. Um, hopefully I'm not now, but <laughs> I, I, really, I really had no idea um, what the throne room was or what contending was. But now looking back on it, that's what I was, I was in a season of contending. So I was stuck at the wall, and I needed an answer, and I would not move. I was not going to make the decision. I was like, Lord, I need you to tell me. I wanted to obey. And I look back, and I know that that, um, that was a lot between me and God. It was, it was special. I'm not going to cry. So there I was, and I got a prophetic word from uh, my pastor's wife at the time. She put her hand on my knee after a counseling session, and she said to me, the Lord is going to speak to you in a way that it, it will be an experience like nothing else, and it, it will be so true to you, so real to you, that it will be something that can never be taken away. So I was like, great, that's exactly what I need. So a couple days later, I was on my lunch break. I worked in sales at the time in Asheville, and I could actually just go take my break up on the parkway because it wasn't that far. And so I just zip up there and eat my lunch in the car. And this day, I was like, I'm going to get out of the car. I don't know why. And I actually just stepped my foot onto the curb of the parkway. And immediately I was in another place. And now I realize, in fact, in that moment, I knew I was in the throne room. Never even heard of the throne room. But I knew where I was. Anybody would if you're human. And I'm not a visual person, so for me it was just full of light. And I heard his voice. And he gave me the answer that I needed, and it was like Pilgrim's Progress, who had the burden on his back, it was like it fell off in that moment, and I was free, and my life was new that day. And it, w it was one of those moments in my life that we, we, I now know I call it an encounter. And later, um, well, okay, before that. So last week, when you guys all were so amazing and wrote me cards and gave me gifts, you blessed me. Thank you so much. There are not a lot of times in your life where you get to hear what other people perceive about you all in one day. And Nick had told me that last year. So I knew when I was opening those cards, I was like, I'm going to look for themes. What does the Lord want to say to me through my friends? And over and over again, 
including Hayden, where's Hayden Luke? He came to me back there and made me ball. And, and over and over again, you guys said to me that I take you into the throne room when I lead worship. And I just was like, whoa. And I went back to that, to that encounter, and I ran to the living room. I was like, Travis, Travis, I have to tell you about this. This is what they keep saying. And remember that story. And, and then I had this teaching. I was taking a worship leading uh, course online, and Ray Hughes is teaching. He's amazing. He's this amazing storyteller and historian and preacher. And he says in this teaching, if you have an encounter as a worshiper, you can carry it, and you can release that encounter. And I did not understand it when he taught me that until I read your cards, until Hayden said that to me. I was like, that's, what, that's what's happening is I am releasing the throne, throne room because of what he did. It's not anything to do with me. It's what he did. And while I was there, I got a verdict yes. in the throne room. I have no idea that that's what happened. But now I'm like, oh, that's exactly what happened. I got a verdict. So I can carry that. And that is what I now see as a purpose for me when I'm leading worship is that I can, I can take you guys into the throne room. We can all go there together because I have that authority. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, I'm going to get y'all to the place where you can get a verdict, too. Mm -hmm. Amen. Just good job. So, similarly, uh, several years ago, the Lord called me chief repenter and asked me to start repenting for my sins, the sins of my family, sins of this church, sins of this community. And I began cleansing my bloodlines. And what I do is I would go in and mention all my different bloodlines, including some spiritual ones, and repent on behalf of those bloodlines. And uh, as I did that, I became aware of all that my family has lost because of disobedience, fear, didn't take assignments they could have taken, lost opportunities. I mean, just think about your family line for a second. How many things do you think they disqualified themselves, they forfeited, they were afraid and didn't try? I mean, just think of how many things we've blown in our family line. And one day as I'm repenting of all those things, the Lord said, get them back. I said, excuse me? And he said, well, he said, when I made your bloodline, I had a purpose for your bloodline. And it was going to bring great glory to me. Your bloodline made a lot of mistakes and messed a lot of stuff up. But do you think I've changed my mind? Do you think that I didn't know how bad y'all would screw it up? But let me ask you a question. Is there a honor camp on the earth today that's contending for every past blessing that's been lost, every past anointing that's been given over, over every past assignment that was not taken, do you not think I couldn't restore in this generation everything previous generations have? So I started doing, doing, going into the throne room with God and started cleansing my bloodline so that I can see that come back like an inheritance lost for my family. That in this generation, they would rise up and give God all the glory he ever intended for the Hunter Camps to give him. So this morning... So that, that's something I've been doing for me and my family until this morning. When she sang the generosity song, we can hardly carry everything he's generously given us. He's talked about our ancestors and what our ancestors, and the, the things, joy that has slipped through our fingers. And the Lord said, this is the song. I turned around in worship. I don't know if you saw me. And I said, I carry that experience, and I've gotten a verdict now I'm carrying it for you and you and you. And I begin to take you into the throne room with your generational mistakes and sit them before the Lord and have your mistakes worship God so that God can begin bringing back and redeeming and restoring to you everything your bloodline has lost. So that's what happened in here. Should have saved that for the last one, what we do for each other in worship. But I might reiterate it or whatever. All right, so there you go. Number three. Uh, by the way, while we're on that, you do realize, don't you, that all of creation makes a sound for him. All of creation sings. The, the, the trees clap their hands. The birds sing. The, the mountains sway. Everything in creation worships him because he deserves it. But there is, we're the worship leaders. We're called to, 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 to show, to resemble God to creation and then reflect creation's praise and glory back to God. 
but we're the worship leaders of heaven because we can sing a song that creation cannot sing. Okay? All of creation can sing these songs and worship God in their own way. But there's one song that only mankind can sing. And because of that one song, we are the worship leaders of all of creation. And that song is the song of redemption. We are the only people he gave the keys to the car to, and we totally wrecked it. And then he came and said, I'll redeem even that. And because of that, and he gave us the keys back, and because of that, we sing the highest praise. You are so good. We really blew it. You were so good and came and saved us. We now sing the song of redemption. There is one that redeems and restores. There is one that replaces and replenishes. We sing the song of redemption because nobody knows your love like we know your love because we walked away from your love and your goodness chased us down. That's the song of redemption. That's why we have to sing our psalm. Last thing is he gives us the gift of power, his power. So the, Hebrews 11, go ahead, worship team, if you guys want to go ahead and head this direction. Hebrews 11, 1 through 3 says, Now faith, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made out of things which were visible. This passage tells us that the world was framed by invisible stuff. And it ties it to faith and says faith is the substance. It's the invisible substance that's the building block of our world and our life. But it also ties it to something else, hope. So what happens in worship is that we get a glimpse of the beauty or the power or the grandeur or the size of God, and he extends hope to us. That's why we come on Sunday morning when we don't feel like it, to find hope, to somehow find hope beyond where we are today. And it's when we worship him and we see him as altogether different, something, he shows us a new part of him, suddenly he releases hope from his realm, which then activates faith in me. Hope, I, my faith is based on the hope of his goodness, not me. So what happens then, he releases hope. I respond by letting my faith come up, and he always responds to faith. He releases his power based on that faith. You feel that? You feel that? Many times in Scripture, when the people of God began to worship, he released his power for healing, forgiveness, deliverance, breaking chains off, routing enemies. He, but the way he releases his power is he first gives us his hope. We respond with our faith. He responds with his power. So if you came here today and said, I don't have anything to offer him. I just, I just rolled in on fumes emotionally, just barely hanging in there. It's okay. It's okay. He has a gift for you. That gift is his presence. It's his perspective, and it's his power. And he's willing to give that to you just because you drove in and sat down in a place where his presence was visible, and you showed hunger in your life. He's that good. That's the gift he gives us in worship. Now, isn't he worthy of being worshiped because of that? So what we're going to do is they're going to dim the lights, then you can stay seated, or you can stand up, or you can kneel down, or you can prostrate, or whatever you want to do, as long as you're not making a mess with everybody else around you. And we're going to go back and sing one or two worship songs before we dismiss. And let's just receive. Let's, let's, let's just find our receive. Let's, let's receive the gift he wants to give us today. Maybe it's a new perspective on something. Maybe it's hope on something. But this is our moment. So you can stand. You can be seated. We're going to lower the lights and just go back in this song.
Lord, extend your throne room to this place right here. Let your light flood in this place as we stand and sit and lay and kneel. Would you just extend your throne room to beyond us that we could find our place in that heavenly realm. And we are not afraid of your throne. We're not afraid of your authority. We're not afraid of judgment. You're a good and just God. You're merciful and you're just. And we know that you want us to come to you and confess our sins. Come to you and lay our, our burdens down. Come to you with our failures and lay them down. So in this place, we find our worship, not from the darkness looking in, but in the midst of the light of the throne room of God. The song we sing that you're realigning destinies. So right now, we ask that you would do that, that right now, the things that were broken, the things that were mistakes, the years that we squandered, would you begin to realign destinies in this room right now? Begin to make rights out of wrongs. Begin to heal wounds. Begin to change our minds about who you are and the power of you to finish what you have begun. We, we, we lean into the faithfulness of God, who is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the one who finishes what he has begun. We recognize the eternal moment we're in right now as we face you in your throne, that you are good, good Father. And we receive from you your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness, your hope right now. We receive that, your love. We receive it now in Jesus' name. And from that, we find a response, a promise, a word, a song, an action to express back to you our complete delirious love for you and joy in you.
going to sing one more song before we dismiss. Last service, we had the altar ministers come down, but there's not room up here. So if you need prayer before you leave, grab somebody around you and ask them to pray with you. You can do that during this song, but don't leave without getting from God what you need in this moment. And so as we sing this song, we're going to continue to worship. But if you need prayer with someone, you need somebody to come in agreement, just grab somebody around you and ask them to pray with you.
Melanie is singing a song right now about trading. We trade our sorrows for his joy. We trade our ashes for his beauty. Trade with him right now. Draw close to him and trade with him. Not just your good stuff, but trade any of your bad stuff. You have an opportunity to do business with heaven right now. Don't be in a hurry. Take just a moment and find something that you want to trade with him. Could we, could we seal this moment together? Could you just let me lead you in a prayer real quick? Could we do that? Gracious Father, we come before you. We confess our sins before you today. We recognize that we have come into agreement with the enemy. We have walked in disobedience we have not done your will we take responsibility for that but today we stand before you and the throne of heaven and we confess those sins and your word which always is truthful says that you are faithful and just to forgive us when we confess our sins that you blot them out of our book you remove them from far as the east is from the west and you remember them against us no more from this place of Jesus' righteousness that he imputed to us from the cross we stand boldly before your throne without fear of our loving Father or your actions towards us. We trade you not only our sin, our weakness, our failures, our dysfunctions. We bring them all and we give them to you. We remind you that your word says that you give good gifts you're a good, good Father. So we receive the fullness of what you want to trade with us today. We give you our past for your future and receive everything that you want to give to us from our past bloodline or from the new things you want to do. Open our hearts to see what we do not see, to hear what we do not hear, to be able to receive what we've not been able to receive, and to trust you that he who has begun a good work is faithful to complete it. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.